Hello and welcome to NPTEL MOOC on Applied Electromagnetics for Engineers. In this module we will study what is called as rectangular waveguides. As we have already discussed waveguides offer to work at a much higher frequency and also have a larger bandwidth than a simple two wire like transmission line structures. The difference between a transmission line and a waveguide also we have emphasized. So, if you want to imagine how a rectangular waveguide would look, you can actually look at this uh, you know duster. So, you see here that this is actually a cubical or rather this is actually having a cross section which is rectangular. Okay. It may not, yeah, it is a rectangular cross section, this is the height of the structure and this is the width of the structure. In our usual rectangular waveguides, we would find that the width is actually larger than the height of the structures. And what you have to also notice is that there is a uniform cross section along the z axis. This is the direction where we assume that the waves are propagating. Okay. And this is actually a very good model because you see this entire material, the so called waveguide is actually made out of a single, this is not a waveguide, this is a duster, but anyway. So, the entire thing is actually made out of a single material except for this uh, you know, dusting portion. If you just remove this one, then everything is just a uh, you know just a wood material. This is filled with the same wood material, but in practice you would see these waveguides to be just air filled. Air filled is another fancy word for saying that they would be hollow. Okay. So, you will have an x axis, you will so you will have an x axis, you will have a y axis and then you will have a z axis along which the wave is supposed to propagate. But please remember this entire thing is actually made out of metal. Okay. So, this is this is the model of a waveguide that we are going to analyze. And as I have already pointed out, if I were to cut this duster at various places, which is now like cutting a waveguide at various places and examine the cross section, the cross section actually remains the same. So, that is the reason why we call this as uniform waveguides. Okay. So, how do we go about analyzing such rectangular waveguides or for the matter if I do not consider the rectangular waveguide, I consider the circular cross section, then I will be considering what is called a circular waveguide. Right? So, how do I analyze a circular waveguide or a metallic rectangular waveguide for whatever you know to find out the fields and find out when what is the operating range and all the other things. Right? There is in general a nice systematic way of doing this. The systematic way of doing this is to begin by separating the fields into two parts. One part would be what is called as the axial part, which is the way in which the which is the field component along the direction of propagation. So, in this case E z and H z for a rectangular waveguide would correspond to the axial or the longitudinal components. Then you have the other components which are transverse to the direction of propagation. Direction of propagation is z. So, transverse to the z would mean x and y direction. So, the fields E x, E y, H x and H y are called as the transverse components and usually it turns out that these metallic waveguides can be analyzed by first expressing all the transverse components in terms of the longitudinal components, solve for the longitudinal component, apply boundary condition and from there once you have the longitudinal uh, components known to you as a function of x, y, z and time. Okay. Then you can go back and find out the other components either by Maxwell's equations or by a relationship of transverse to longitudinal components. Okay. Unfortunately, we will be not having enough time to develop this method of pro, you know, analyzing waveguides in complete detail. So, I will be skipping over a few details leaving them as exercises for you. They are not very hard, they just take up a little bit of time because they involve lot of algebraic manipulations. Okay. But the four part methodology is what we are going to follow. Okay. So, we will first begin by looking at the Maxwell's equations themselves that is the 0th part you might say and then the first part would be to express the transverse components in terms of the longitudinal components. Okay. And then you solve the longitudinal component expressions for the longitudinal components must be obtained appropriate boundary conditions will be applied and once you have done that solution, it is easy to go back and find out the full solution because transverse components are already known in the terms of the longitudinal components. Okay. So, we begin by recapitulating Maxwell's equations or maybe even before that I can first give you the cross section that I am going to consider. This is the cross section of the waveguide that I am going to consider. Okay. So, here I have not drawn the cross section, I am trying to draw the 3D picture of this. 
So, I have one axis let us say axis x which along which we have the width of the waveguide. So, it is bounded by x equal to 0 and x equal to a along this axis is the y axis which is from 0 to b and this one would be the direction of propagation. Okay. So, it could be either this direction or because of the right hand rule then this would be the actual direction I mean this would be the conventional z direction, but the wave is assumed to propagate along the waveguide itself. So, in this case the wave is propagating along minus z direction or you can just redefine z and minus z does not really matter what you do. Alternatively you can interchange the x axis. So, you can consider x equal to 0 and x equal to minus a and then you will obtain the conventional z direction of propagation. Okay. So, do not worry about what that z axis is just look at the fact that this entire thing is actually made out of a single conductor and inside this waveguide there is actually nothing it is an air filled waveguide as we would call it. Okay. Um, first step would be to recapitulate Maxwell's equations and I am going to do that one okay, with little bit of changes in the sense that I know that the waves have to propagate along the z axis therefore, along z as a function of z we would like all the field components to have a form which is exponential of minus gamma z where gamma is the complex propagation constant in general. Okay. If we consider lossless waveguides then gamma will be pure imaginary being equal to j beta in general it will also have some amount of losses I mean the waveguide has some amount of losses because of the imperfect dielectric or imperfect um, conducting material. So, there will be some non-zero value of alpha whatever that is all the field components are assumed to have e to the power minus gamma z dependence on the z coordinate. We will also assume that all field components are being evaluated at a particular frequency omega. Okay. The reason for that one is that any given you know uh, function of time which is reasonable function can always be split into its Fourier components or different frequency components. In other words, you can actually find out the corresponding spectrum and if you know how each spectral component propagates through the waveguide then it is just an easy matter to actually put propagate each of these frequencies and then put them back together in order to obtain the way in which the pul originally pulse like function or some general function of time would propagate. Okay. So, this is the reason why we, we initially started with the phasor assumption that we will be looking at only one frequency and then expressing all the quantities as phasors and that is what we are going to do. Okay. So, from now onwards we will not really carry over this e power j omega t because all field components are phasors. Okay. All field components in terms of z will have e power minus gamma z. Okay. For the rectangular waveguide that we have assumed, so let me remove this one. So, let me just remove this axis part otherwise it might be a little bit confusing. Okay. So, for this rectangular waveguide the perpendicular or the transverse components will be the components E x and E y whereas, the longitudinal component will be the z component longitudinal or axial component for the electric field. Of course, for the magnetic field you will have h x, h y and h z. In general in a waveguide all 6 components are non-zero. Okay. All 6 e x, e y, e z, h x, h y, h z are non-zero. It is possible for us to separate out the kind of fields that you are going to see inside the waveguide into two groups. One group is called as the T e group or the T e modes we will define what a mode is shortly and then the other mode or the other group is the T m mode solutions. Okay. This T e and T m breakup actually comes just by the simple thing of you know an obliquely incident light can be broken up in terms of its T e and T m components individually you know, you know how to you know reflect of a T e component T m component. So, if I have an initial polarization which is a combination of T e and T m break it up see how they re, you know reflect from a given interface and then add them up together. So, that is essentially what we have been doing and that is true for the rectangular waveguides as well. So, you can break it up into T e and T m and it turns out that as long as the width a is larger than the height b usually about 2 b or something then the first group of waves that would propagate inside the waveguide turns out to be the T e modes. So, practically speaking the T e modes are the ones which are called as the fundamental or dominant modes 
not every T, but there is a dominant mode called T 1 0, okay, where we will also discuss what we mean by M, you know the 1 and 0 subscripts that we have put in. But this is called as the dominant mode, because as the frequency starts to increase and reaches beyond a certain critical frequency, this mode T 1 0 mode is the first one to begin propagation. Okay. So, we will focus our attention on to the T modes. I will not really look at the T m modes, because the analysis is kind of very similar. Uh, you will do that as part of the exercises. Okay. So, what do we do with the T e modes? Well, in the T e modes, the characterization is that the electric field component E z would be equal to 0. Okay. So, that is the reason why we would call as T e mode, right? it is all transverse, the electric field is completely transverse to the direction of propagation transverse meaning it is having components only in x and y that is it has components only of x and y. So, E z is equal to 0 anyway. So, that is the transverse electric mode. So, what components are remaining now? So, you have E x, you have E y, you have H x, H y and H z all these quantities will be functions of x and y, but all of them will be functions of z in just a single manner that is of e power minus gamma z. Okay. Now, you can actually look at an additional uh, you know result because of the dependence of e power minus gamma z. What would be d by dz or let us say the partial derivative del by del z of any field quantity whose z dependence will be in the form of e power minus gamma z and the field dependence is of x and y. Well, this is a function of x and y therefore, this would not change anyway, but because del by del z of e power minus gamma z would simply pull out minus gamma leave the other things as it is field of x y e power minus gamma z. So, this is the original field component that we looked at as a function of x y and z, but because del by del z is there it would pull out minus gamma and you get minus gamma field of this quantity. Okay. So, I can replace wherever in the curl operations that I get or in any of the other operations del by del z with minus gamma. I can also replace del square by del z square with gamma square obviously, because gamma will be pulled out twice from the differential. So, that would be minus gamma into minus gamma. So, that would become gamma square. Okay. With this setting let us write down the curl equation. So, I have del cross E is equal to minus j omega mu into h. Okay. So, this is the point form of Faraday's law that we have written and then the second curl equation is del cross h will be equal to j omega epsilon E. Okay. Why? Because there is no current inside the hollow medium, there is no wire which is actually carrying a current or there is nothing like a conduction current present inside whatever current that is there inside the rectangular waveguide that has to be displacement current and displacement current is epsilon del E by del T, del by del T is in phasor notation j omega. So, that is the reason why you have j omega epsilon times E. So, the waveguide is filled with mu and epsilon. Initially, we have assumed that these you know can be air or can be anything else, but whatever it is essentially uh, something that would not support any conduction current ideal dielectrics is what we have assumed. Usually as I said it would be mu naught and epsilon naught, but let us be general and then say it could be any mu and epsilon it could be filled with some glass or something else, but as long as they have a constant value of mu and epsilon and these do not have any value of sigma this theory that we are going to develop will be all right. Okay. Otherwise you will have to make a little bit of modifications. Okay. Write down the curl equations for E and curl equations for H separately all the time realizing that del by del z can be written as minus gamma. So, if you do that and also realize that E z is equal to 0, you get two groups of equations. So, you get gamma E y, when I write E y I obviously mean that it is a function of both x and y as well. It is not a function of z because well the z dependency is minus gamma we have already taken it out. right? So, this would be equal to minus j omega mu h x, okay? then you have minus gamma E x equals minus j omega mu h y, then you have del E y by del x. Well, unfortunately, I cannot simplify this because I do not know how E y behaves with respect to x nor I know how E x behaves with respect to y. Therefore, this I cannot remove. So, I will just keep it as it is. I have a second group of equations coming from del cross h that would be del h z by del y 
plus gamma h y is equal to j omega epsilon e x then you have minus gamma h x minus del h z by del x is equal to j omega epsilon e y. Finally, I have del h y by del x, I do not know how they behave with respect to x or with respect to y, so I will just keep them as it is, but luckily this is the equation. Now, these equations are all mixed in terms of e y, e x, h x, h y and h z. What I would like to do is to express e y purely in terms of h z or its derivatives and I can do that. In order to do that one, I just have to combine a couple of equations. I know how to express E y in terms of h x from this expression, correct? And this expression here has h x on the right hand side, it has a component h x, there is an E y here. If I write down E y in terms of h or rather h x in terms of E y, substitute into this second equation, the two equations are linked kind of a thing, right? So, substitute into one, then I will obtain E y in terms of h x. So, if I do that, what do I get? I already know how to express h x. So, I will have minus gamma by j omega mu E y. So, h x is actually this. So, if you are not convinced, you can look at this one. h x is equal to minus gamma by j omega mu into E y, correct? I go and substitute that into the other expression. So, substituting this into the other expression which I have marked will give you gamma square by j omega mu E y minus j omega epsilon times E y equals del h z by del x. I can take E y as a common factor out. So, I will get gamma square plus omega square mu epsilon times E y equals j omega mu del h z by del x or finally, E y is equal to j omega mu divided by h square del h z by del x, where h square is what we have defined this quantity gamma square omega gamma square plus omega square mu epsilon has. Okay. So, I have defined this as h square, so this is by definition. So, what I have done is to start with the Maxwell's equations and somehow be able to express all the uh, uh, or at least I have shown you how to do it for one case, I will leave the other expressions for you to find out. So, how do I represent the transverse components in terms of the longitudinal components? Okay? You can then show, I will leave this as exercises for you, you can show that E x can be written as minus j omega mu by h square del h z by del y. Please note that electric field E y will have del h z by del x, electric field E x will be del h z by del y. Similarly, h x will be equal to minus gamma by h square. So, this is minus gamma by h square del h z by del x and then finally, you have h y minus gamma by h square del h z by del y. Okay? So, I will leave this as exercises for you to show that. Again, you just have to combine a few equations and you will be able to find this out. Okay, so, at least our problem is simple, right? I just need to solve for h z. So, if I only need to solve for h z, uh, what I can do? is to, diff so equation 3, you know, on this one, I can actually differentiate this one with respect to x, right. So, after substituting for the equation E y and substituting the equation for E x from the ones that we already have, I can differentiate this one with respect to x and differentiate this one with respect to y and put the two solutions together, then what do I obtain? I obtain del square h z by del x square plus del square h z by del y square plus h square h z equal to 0. Okay. So, all I have to do is go back to this equation and then substitute for E y. I know E y is equal to j omega mu by del h, I mean h square. I do not have to differentiate, I just have to substitute for E y and then substitute for E x into these expressions because E y will be j omega mu by h square into uh, del h z by del x, there is already a del by del x over here. So, this fellow will become j omega mu by h square del square h z by del x square. Okay. Similarly, you can show what will happen to this one, combine them, pull them together and you will be able to find this. Okay. I will leave this also as an exercise. Incidentally, this equation is called as h 
helm holds equation ok so what we have done is to derive an equation for h z in this equations h z is actually a function of x and y ok so we do not really put the function of z because we already know how it would prop it would go as a function of z now how do i solve this equation have we met this equation earlier yes we have met this equation earlier if you remember in the Laplace's equation solution right we had solved equations which were similar to this. So, you had del square e by or del square v by del x square plus del square v by del y square equal to some term in the Poisson's equation that was equal to some right hand side you know term which was a source term and we applied a particular method called as variable separable method. We in fact did this for the infinite square trough problem right. So, we did this problem of variable separable where we showed if you have a single component whether it is the voltage V or H Z which satisfies this particular uh, you know type of an equation partial differential equation then you can write that component as product of two functions one of which is function of x alone and the other one is a function of y alone ok. So, what we mean there is that h z as a function of x and y can be written as x of x and y of y and you can substitute these expressions into the Helmholtz equation and then obtain the resulting differential equation second order differential equations ok. When you do that you will get d square x by d x square equals some minus k x square x and d square y by d y square equals some minus k y square y ok such that the constants minus k x square minus k y square plus h square should be equal to 0 or h square is equal to k x square plus k y square since h square is nothing but gamma square plus omega square mu epsilon right. So, I can write this as gamma square equals or gamma equals the complex propagation gamma is equal to square root of uh, k x square plus k y square minus omega square mu epsilon. Of course, I still do not know what is k x and k y, but I will be able to find that one out by solving these equations individually. Now, these are simple second order differential equations whose solutions I know x of x will be some a x sin k x of x plus some b y or other b x cos k x of x because of the second order solution which is this one. Similarly, y of y will be a y here it is the same thing except that k x is replaced by k y and it x replaced by y plus you have b y cos k y into y. The full solution for h z as a function of x and y is given by x of x into y of y ok. Now, this we have completed is in the second part. Now, what do we do? Well, we need to apply boundary conditions. So, what sort of boundary conditions we should apply? We have boundary conditions for the magnetic field, but the magnetic field tangential component boundary condition means that I have to know what is the surface current. Since I do not know the surface current and surface currents can exist, no current can exist in the hollow region, but on the surface currents can exist because that is just a metal, right. But I do not know what is that surface current. So, I cannot really apply the conditions for the tangential component of the magnetic field. But on a metallic perfect electric conductor, the electric field tangential component must go to 0. So, I know that equation and in this example that we are considering the T E modes, there are only two components E x and E y and there are four walls that I need to consider right, left wall, right wall, bottom wall and top wall and I have to find out on these walls which are the components which are tangential and apply the boundary condition that, that that tangential component at that particular wall must go to 0 right. So, let us go back and write down the cross section. So, this is the cross section that I have. So, this is the this is y equal to this is the y then this is y equal to b. So, this is 0 and this is along x this is equal to a. So, I have this wall here bottom right top and left wall ok. So, on this wall what is the uh, change that is happening x is actually changing, but y is equal to constant right. So, on this wall y is equal to 0 how is how are the electric field E x and E y oriented E x is along this way, but E y will be oriented this way right it would be going from bottom to the top. So, it would be vertical out there. So, clearly this is not the tangential component this is the tangential component. So, I will put a tick mark against that 
ok. So, my boundary condition is that E x at y equal to 0 must be equal to 0 ok. Similarly, if I look at what is the tangential component here again the x directed component is tangential the y directed component would still be vertical whether it is up or pointing up or pointing down does not matter it is still vertical out there. So, the other boundary condition that I am going to obtain will again depend only on this E x and I have E x at y equal to a equal to 0 ok. Similarly, for the right wall and for the left wall you can see that this is E x whereas, this one is E y. So, obviously, this is a tangential component E x is normal here E y is the tangential component I can put it right. So, I will have E y at x equal to 0 being equal to 0 E y at x equal to a is also equal to 0. That is my problem solved well not really I need to know what is E x E x and E y, but I do not know E x and E y except that I know E x and E y through this relationship. I know E y as j omega mu by h square del h z by del x. I know what is h z, h z is x of x into y of y where x of x is this y of y is this. So, if I differentiate this one with respect to x then I will get E y component and multiply it with some j omega mu by h square. Similarly, if I multiply by some constant and then differentiate this expression x of x y of x uh, I mean h z of x y by y then I will get another uh, I mean I will get a component for uh, E x component right. So, if I do that what I obtain since E x is proportional to h z by del y and E y is proportional to del h z by del x ok and substituting for y equal to 0. So, what will happen is there is a component here sin k x of x. So, differentiating sin will give you cos pulls k x out, but then differentiating cos will give you sin and pulls minus k x out right. So, similarly it will be for y as well. So, there will be a minus sign in the differential x prime of x and y prime of y you can actually show that one right and then apply the boundary condition. Now, here I am going to leave this as an exercise for you. So, when you apply the boundary condition at y equal to 0 you will see that a very interesting thing when you apply y equal to 0 you will see that a y is 0 ok, but when you apply the boundary condition at y equal to b when you apply the boundary condition this means that k y into b must be equal to some integer multiple of pi because there will be some sign of component right. So, there will be k y into b equal to n pi which actually gives you the value of k y given by n pi by b ok. Similarly, if you apply the boundary condition at x equal to 0 and x equal to a you will find k x a equal to some integer multiple of pi. So, that k x itself is equal to m pi by a and these values are now known because a is known pi is known m and n are in your control. The mode that I mentioned T e 1 0 is actually obtained by putting m equal to 1 and n equal to 0 ok. And then what happened to gamma? Gamma was given by square root of k x square plus k y square minus omega square mu epsilon, but this is k x square and k y square are nothing but m pi by a whole square plus n pi by b whole square minus omega square mu epsilon under root. What kind of a gamma do you want? You want gamma to be pure imaginary right gamma to be pure imaginary for a lossless propagation right. When will this square root thing become imaginary right or when will this fellow become imaginary when the quantity here will be greater than omega square mu epsilon or sorry less than omega square mu epsilon correct. So, that when that happens you can rearrange the equation and say gamma equals j beta which is equal to j times square root of omega square mu epsilon minus m pi by a whole square plus n pi by b whole square let me put this inside the root ok inside the bracket. So, this right hand side of, of this expression square root of omega square mu epsilon minus m pi by a whole square plus n pi by b whole square right will give you the propagation coefficient or the propagation constant of the modes ok. And this has actually happened under the condition that omega square mu epsilon is greater than or at the lowest side it must be equal to 
m pi by a whole square plus n pi by b whole square. Okay. If I define this quantity n what is this m pi by a whole square and n pi by b whole square, if I define this as some omega c square mu epsilon because it is just a constant I can redefine it as omega c square mu epsilon and please remember omega c will depend on m and n. Okay. So, omega c actually depends on m and n mu and epsilon of course, does, does not depend on that one. And since omega c is nothing but 2 pi f c, right? this f c is what we call as cut off frequency. So, only when the applied frequency or the operating frequency actually exceeds the cut off frequency, then gamma will become pure imaginary which means there will be lossless propagation inside a waveguide. As long as the frequency is less than the frequency cut off frequency for that value of m and n because this actually changes with m and n right. So, if you if your operating frequency is less than the cut off frequency for that given pair of numbers m and n then that particular mode will simply be attenuating it will never propagate. Okay. So, that is the reason why sometimes you know these waveguides are called as high pass filters or exhibit a high pass filter characteristic because when the frequency is less than the cutoff frequency for the given mode number m and n there would not be any propagation only when the frequency exceeds the cutoff frequency then that particular mode actually begins to propagate. And the TE10 mode is the mode which will propagate at the lowest frequency possible. So, given a rectangular waveguide of certain cross sections the lowest frequency cutoff frequency occurs for the so called TE10 mode where m is equal to 1 and n equal to 0. We will see what is that cutoff frequency. Well, cutoff frequency is omega c square mu epsilon is equal to m pi by a whole square plus n pi by b whole square. right? So, this is in general. Now, I can write down what is omega c or equivalently I can write down what is 2 pi f c. This is 1 by square root of mu epsilon square root of m pi by a whole square plus n pi by b whole square. In these equations this pi and pi can be removed outside the square root. So, when you remove them outside the square root it becomes pi that pi can be cancelled off with this pi. Okay. So, essentially I can cancel off this pi's. So, f c the cutoff frequency which is actually dependent on m and n sometimes I will use the upper script to just denote that this is a quantity that depends on the mode number m and n this is given by 1 by 2 square root mu epsilon into square root of m by a whole square plus n by b whole square. But what is 1 by square root mu epsilon that is actually if you had instead of a waveguide if you just had the medium as it is and just you know imagine that the waveguide has a width a going off to infinity and width or the height b going off to infinity then it is just a medium in between with mu and epsilon. And if you launch a plane wave then that plane wave would propagate with a certain phase velocity given by 1 by square root mu epsilon and if mu is equal to mu naught epsilon is equal to epsilon naught then that velocity will be the velocity of light in free space right. So, that would be c speed of light. In general let me call that as u p 0 where u p 0 denotes the phase velocity of the medium with the waveguide walls moved to infinity and the medium is essentially uh, you know consisting or characterized by mu and epsilon values itself. So, that could be u p 0. So, this is u p 0 by 2 m by a whole square n by b whole square under root. Okay. I promised you that T 1 0 is the fundamental mode I will show you that one. Okay. When m is equal to 1 and n is equal to 0 what will happen to this expression here? This expression will be u p 0 divided by 2 a because n is equal to 0. So, that will be gone and this is equal to this. So, the cutoff frequency f c 1 0 will be u p 0 by 2 a. Okay. Now, suppose you try m equal to 0 and n equal to 1. This would correspond to the mode T e 0 1 whereas, this corresponds to the mode T e 1 0. Right. So, what would be the cutoff frequency here f c of 0 1 is equal to u p 0 divided by 2 b. Well, we have already said that a is greater than b because a is greater than b and a and b appear in the denominator rather than in the numerator the cutoff frequency of f c 1 0 will be less than the cutoff frequency of f c 0 1. Okay. So, this is true for a 
typical waveguide that we consider, the cutoff frequency for the 1 0 mode will always be lower than the 0 1 mode. You might question whether m equal to 0, n equal to 0 condition is possible. Well, let us go back and look at the expressions x of x and y of y. Okay? So, you had h of z to be equal to x of x into y of y. So, in this we have also seen after applying the, the boundary condition where we had applied a y is 0 and similarly uh, I had shown you I think a x is also 0. Okay? So, yeah I, a x is also 0 that would have come from this expression I think somewhere over here. Okay, I have not mentioned, but please note that one. Okay, a x is also 0. So, if I go back to these expressions, a x is 0, a y is 0. So, the equations are not containing the sine terms, they will contain the cosine terms. Okay, but our electric field components are actually derived, you know, proportional to the differential of these quantities, right. E y is proportional to uh, del h z by del x, which means they will be of the form sin k x into x sin k y into y and when m is equal to 0 and n is equal to 0 then what will happen k x will be 0 k y will be 0. So, electric field components will be completely 0. So, the condition that we had here m equal to 0 n equal to 0 can never occur in practice because this condition is a most trivial condition which tells you that there is no field at all. Okay? You cannot have just a magnetic field, right? You don't just have H x, H H y, and H z because it is a time varying scenario, and E y and E x because they are proportional to sin k x x and sin k y y. If they are not present, if m is equal to zero and n equal to zero, both are zero, then the total field will actually be equal to zero. Okay? So please keep that in mind, and therefore this F c one zero, the frequency T e one zero, uh, whose cutoff frequency is F c one zero, is called as the fundamental or the dominant mode. Now, I have used the word mode a lot of time. So, what is the mode that I am talking about? Mode is just a pattern of the electric field or the magnetic field depending on what you are you know what you would like to use it or sometimes the pattern of the power itself the pointing vector itself, but more or less it is taken as the way in which the electric field pattern looks like as a function of x and y. So, in the cross section of the waveguide that I have what is the way in which the electric field whether it is E y or E x how is it distributed. Please note that this distribution is governed by two things one is by Maxwell's equations right because that will tell you how the electric fields are actually uh, you know propagating inside the wave right? and second the way this particular fields are you know arranged is determined also by the boundary condition. Okay? So, you will see that the mode shapes for the T e 1 0 mode will be slightly different for T e 0 1, T e 2 0 and what not other modes. And if you replace the metallic waveguides with dielectric waveguides such as optical fibers then the modes will be different okay? because it is not just the Maxwell's equations which are determining the modes, but also the boundary of the waveguide or the boundary conditions that you need to impose. Okay? Let us go back, we are not completely done with the waveguide solution out there. So far we had considered the general T e modes, but we know that T e 1 0 is the dominant mode whose cutoff frequency F c 1 0 is given by u p 0 divided by 2 a correct. So, we have already seen this one with that and with the fact that H z of x and y will be some constant right cos of k x x okay? with n equal to 0 that cos of k y into y will be equal to 1. Okay, so, this will be cos of k x and what is k x here? We are looking at m equal to 1 therefore, this must be equal to pi by a for the T e 1 0 mode k x is equal to pi by a therefore, this would be cos pi by a into x and in terms of z it would be e power minus j beta into z where beta we have already determined from that expression and this would be some constant which we will call as constant h 0. Right? If you are not happy with the constant well you know this is the constant that would be uh, b x into or rather b x into b y something like that. right? So, b x into b y that would be the constant that would be left out. We simply put all of them into a single constant h 0. Okay? Now, I know that e y is proportional to del h z by del x and e x is proportional to del h z by del y. Right? It is just proportional because there are also factors of j omega mu by 
gamma square or not gamma square it is j omega mu by h square right h is the uh, quantity i think so let me go back and correct that one for you so that is j omega mu for e y it is the proportionality constant is j omega mu by h square but now h square is actually equal to gamma square plus omega square mu epsilon right but gamma is actually pure imaginary so that would be minus beta square plus omega square mu epsilon so this is actually omega square mu epsilon minus beta square okay so you can actually put that one down out here and instead of this you can look at this also you know that beta square is equal to omega square mu epsilon minus uh, kx square plus ky square in the te10 mode k ky square is actually equal to 0 right because ky n equal to 0 so omega square minus beta square is actually equal to kx square kx square is nothing but pi by a whole square so you can actually put all these constants and then show that the corresponding uh, you know the corresponding uh, component ey will be equal to minus j omega mu minus because that would be some term that would be coming out in the negative sign there in the in the solution you can show that times h0 sin pi by a into x e power minus j beta z luckily or unluckily you do not have e x component in this case so e x is actually equal to 0 then you have h x component given by j beta a by pi h 0 sin pi by a x e power minus j beta times z ok. Then finally h z although I have written already h z what is it h z is h 0 cos pi by a x e power minus j beta into z ok. What about the other components that we have? So, e x is 0, e y is 0, e z anyway is equal to 0 because this is the T e mode and then turns out that h y will also be equal to 0 for T e 1 0 mode ok. So, these are the conditions for T e 1 0 mode as you can disc, you know derive and then show that these expressions are correct. Now, I would like you to take a look at these expressions ok, especially look at this e y and observe how it is actually changing with respect to x the corresponding you know weight which is changing with respect to x the function is actually a sine function does it make sense well it does because remember e y is tangential to two walls which are those walls they are the side walls right so you had the side wall over there which was at x equal to 0 and another side wall at x equal to a correct and of course, you had the other two walls along y equal to 0 and y equal to b, but on x equal to 0 and x equal to a, e y had to go to 0. So, essentially its amplitude would be 0 at this point. Similarly, amplitude of e y at x equal to a must also be equal to 0. What sort of functions, trigonometric functions that can I fit into this one? Well, I can fit in a nice half a sign, right, such that sine of x equal to 0 sin of x at pi will also be equal to 0 right. So, I can fit in this way and I can also fit in a different one I cannot of course make this 1 because it is all 0. So, the other way I can fit this function would be to fit this way one complete sin cycle right and what is stopping me from fitting other type of functions well I can fit this one as well. So, I can fit any number of integral half any number of half multiples of the sine wave that is or the multiples of half sine wave ok. The most fundamental mode will be the one that will actually fit with only a single half cycle of the sinusoidal signal and that happens to be the T e 1 0 mode. So, this component will actually be for T e 1 0 mode and these are the higher order components ok. So, these are the higher order modes or not components they are the higher order modes ok. There are a few definitions that go with waveguides that we should be familiar with. We define lambda g z ok as the guide wavelength and this guide wavelength is actually something that is measured along the z axis which is the direction of propagating modes right. So, the modes are actually propagating along the z direction and this is given by 2 pi by beta. Beta is actually the propagation constant which tells you how it is how the phase factor is changing with respect to z, but I know what is beta in terms of omega 
right. So, beta is actually given by square root of omega square mu epsilon minus omega c square mu epsilon because I just wrote that k x square plus k y square in this fashion. I can pull this omega square mu epsilon out as a common factor. So, I will actually have omega square root mu epsilon for beta I am writing inside it would be 1 minus f c by f whole square under root. Okay. So, now what is the guide wavelength lambda g z is equal to 2 pi 2 pi divided by omega square root mu epsilon 1 minus f c by f whole square under root. Okay. What is 2 pi by omega square root of uh, mu epsilon now? Omega is 2 pi into f correct and 1 by square root mu epsilon is nothing but the phase velocity of the free space media that we consider. So, u p 0 divided by f into this factor 1 by square root of 1 minus f c by f whole square. Okay. What is u p 0 by f? It is actually the uh, wa uh, you know, wavelength of a wave which is propagating in, in the medium uh, characterized by mu and epsilon. Correct. This is the velocity, velocity by frequency is the wavelength. So, this is actually operating wavelength lambda 0 divided by 1 minus f c by f whole square. Okay. What would be the phase velocity? Well, phase velocity will be related to the guide wavelength because the phase velocity is the velocity with which the wave is travelling along the z direction. That is the direction in which the wave is propagating. So, you will have to calculate the wave guide length along the z direction and multiply by the frequency. Okay. So, it is not calculated in the direction normal to it. I will come back to that in a moment, but the phase velocity that we mean is the velocity with which the wave is propagating along the z direction and for that one you have to just multiply the frequency and lambda g into z and if you do that you will see this is given by u p 0 divided by square root of 1 minus f c by f whole square. Is it a problem? Well, what will be mu when mu is equal to mu naught and epsilon is equal to epsilon naught? In that case, u p 0 which is the phase velocity of the medium will be equal to speed of light. So, what we say is that the phase velocity is equal to c divided by square root of 1 minus f c by f whole square. Right? What is f and f c, how is f and f c related? f is actually greater than f c. So, which means the denominator here will be a quantity less than 1. If this is less than 1, then the phase velocity is actually greater than c. Does it violate relativity, Einstein's relativity? Well, it does not really violate Einstein's relativity because the wave which is propagating with this phase velocity is carrying 0 information. The information is actually carried at a different velocity called as group velocity, which we will meet in the next class okay, or in the next lecture. But for now, v g the group velocity is defined as d omega by d beta. So, it is not the ratio of omega to beta as it would be, but this is d omega to d beta and it turns out to be u p 0 into square root of 1 minus f c by f whole square. Okay. So, luckily we have a relationship which tells you that the phase velocity and the group velocity, group velocity is the you know, velocity with which the wave is actually propagating, I mean carrying information. So, this is given by u p 0 square. So, this relationship always holds phase velocity by itself does not mean anything. Okay. Well, we have waves and we know that we can actually form the ratio of these wave components or the field components that are there. And when we form the ratios of electric field to the magnetic field, we end up with impedances. right? So, we have a T e impedance which is defined as minus E y by h x. Okay. This minus E y by h x is simply because the wave is supposed to propagate along z direction. So, the impedance also is chosen such that it kind of points into the z direction. So, the impedance z T e is minus E y by h x and you can substitute from the previous values or previous expressions for E y and h x and show that this can be written as uh, omega mu divided by omega square root mu epsilon and this factor 1 minus f c by f whole square factor. Okay. Omega and omega cancel out mu by square root of mu epsilon is nothing but the medium impedance eta 0. Okay. So, eta 0 is square root of mu by epsilon divided by square root of 1 minus f c f 
whole square. Okay. So, this is how the T e mode would actually be present and if I, I have only shown you the expression with f c, I have not put in the values of m and n, but you have to put in the values of m and n to figure out the appropriate frequency cutoff frequency and for a given operating frequency form the square root of 1 minus f c by f whole square factor and then multiply or divide eta 0 by that particular factor. Okay. So, this impedance is actually dependent both on m and n. Of course, I would not show you this, but the impedance for T m case will actually be eta 0 into square root of 1 minus f c by f whole square. So, in fact, if you measure the T e impedance and T m impedance, you can actually measure what is the uh, free space mode uh, eta 0. Okay. Now, we have talked about waveguides, waveguides carrying information, but the waveguides as they carry fields, they also carry some amount of power. Right? The power carried along the z direction is obtained, the time average power that is carried along the uh, direction is actually dependent on what mode you are propagating. For the T e 1 0 mode, so average power, the time average power that is being carried, so let me write this out time average power that is carried by the T e 1 0 mode is given by integral of the z component of the pointing vector over the cross section of the waveguide. What is the cross section of the waveguide? x equals 0 to a, y equals 0 to b and you can show that one what should be the s z component? s z component is given by e y cross h x correct or minus e y cross h x because that is the one that would correspond to the z. There is another h z component, but if you take e y cross h z that would be along the x direction. So, that would not give you the z directed pointing vector. So, you do not want this when you just want e minus e y cross h x and because e y is proportional to sin k x x where k x is pi by a, h x is also proportional to the same thing and these two are independent of the y uh, you know coordinate. You can put in the expressions for e y and h x from the previous uh, you know slides that we have put in or we have shown you that you can show that this power carried the time average power carried will be given by omega mu beta a cube b. So, it is dependent as a cube b and the constant h 0 square divided by 4 pi square. Okay. Now, in fact, this is used this expression is used to fix the value of constant h 0. Okay, why? Because you know normally how much power you put in into the waveguide and once you know the power you can actually find out what is h naught, the field strength and then you go back and plug the values of h, h 0 everywhere. So, I would like to finish with the T e mode here uh, and I would like to also, well I have not discussed T m mode, but I just like to give you the intuition of what form of the fields you can actually obtain if you just know the cross section and know the boundary conditions. Okay. So, let us go back to the cross section over here. So, this is the cross section of a waveguide, right. If I am looking at E y component where I want both E y to be function of x and y and E x component to be function of x and y as well as E z component. For example, if I am looking at the T m mode, I need to know what is the E z component as well, right. How do I write down the form of the solutions without actually solving Maxwell's equation? Well, boundary conditions. How does E, so let us also not just show the cross section, it is also extend it because I want to show E z as well. We have already seen what will happen to E y at x equal to 0 and at x equal to a. right? So, you need to have the form of a solution in the form of sin some k x into x or k y into y. right? So, this is at x equal to 0 and x equal to a. So, you need to have that kind of a thing. right? Now, how about E x component? E x component is actually tangential on to the y equal to 0 and y equal to b walls that is for the lower and the upper wall. So, therefore, they must also have a sign type of a function. right? What about E z? Well, E z is tangential to the components. So, because E z is you know along this one, it is actually tangential to the component along the x equal to 0 as well as to the component I mean as well as to the plane or the wall at x equal to a. Moreover, E z is also tangential at the top and the bottom walls. Okay. So, E z component will be sin some k x x sin k y y okay. whereas, E x component being tangential only at 
uh, y equal to 0 and y equal to b will exhibit a sign nature okay, for the y. So, I will write down here. So, sign nature for the y, but it would actually exhibit a cosine nature for the x component. I have not shown it for the other modes, you know, even in the t other mode t to 1 for example, if you evaluate, you will see that this is the form. Okay. Same for E y as well. So, E y will be tangential along the x direction that is for the x equal to 0 wall and x equal to a wall. Therefore, it would be sin k x x whereas, it would be cos k y y. Okay. Of course, the real reason why you solve Maxwell's equation and go to all that lengthy procedure is because you do not know all these constants and without these constants, you really cannot find out all the other values of impedance and other things. right? So, you still need to learn how to solve for the general waveguide with the steps that we have talked about, but intuition should tell you where you are, whether you are getting the right solution or the wrong solution. With this, thank you very much.